I still got to change that opening. I keep forgetting. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. Hello. Welcome to the Morning Photography Show. Today, we're going to be doing some of what we did last time. Different images, different workflows. But for those of you who are new, welcome to Adobe Live. Welcome to the Morning Photography Show. This is my chance to talk more of photography than editing, although we will be doing some editing today. And this is kind of just a mix up, just a switch up, just a kind of try new things. So kind of deviating a little bit from the photography masterclass, talking more about photography. So I do this show and I do the still do the masterclass at least a couple times a month now and welcome to a Monday and I know it's morning somewhere it's afternoon somewhere it's evening somewhere so good morning good afternoon good evening depending on where you are in the world so with that said I see some folks um, chiming in to YouTube already I see some folks of course on Behance uh, for the person on YouTube he says he's from Ghana and how can I get the Photoshop beta you get the Photoshop beta the way we all do. So in your Creative Cloud app, there's a section called beta when you look under the applications and you go there and you'll be able to install the Photoshop beta. So that's how we get it. That's how everyone gets it. Even employees get it that way. All right. Um, Barry Jackson, hello from YouTube. And Victoria, I see you over there on Behance along with General Kenobi, Oliver, Frank, 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 Frank. Hopefully I'm not butchering your name. It's one of the two, I'm sure. Steve, and welcome. And let's go ahead and talk about what we're going to be doing today. So when I did the first episode of the Morning Photography Show, one of the things that stood out that people like commented like more than anything else, they liked having the behind the scenes of the New York shots and just talking about the setup. So they liked that part of it. So I said, huh, and this kind of, this show, this Monday kind of, hit me off guard <laughs> not, not, I just hadn't looked and saw, oh, you got a show you know, in a few days. So I was thinking, okay, what can I do in this show? We're definitely gonna do that segment. And we're just obviously we're gonna use different shots in New York. And I'm gonna talk about not only uh, how I got the shot, but hopefully challenge you to go do some of the things I just did in this particular shoot. And also we'll do some of the editing, some of the post-processing to how I got the final shot. Let's put it that way. So with that said, hey, Sean Lee, what's up? What's up, Sean Lee in Detroit? Welcome. Darren Hood, good morning. So with that said, let's go ahead and dive in. I'm going to switch over to my computer and you will see the kind of shots I'm talking about. They're not my usual. So back in November last year, the true story, I was uh, I was uh, stopped at like, a, I think, a, a, a convenience store or some, I, basically some store. I walked in. And as I was talking to the person at the counter, I hear this low flying jet go by. And I was like, what the, like, like, cause it was so low. I was like, what the heck is that? And she says, like, like I'm from another planet. It's an air show. <laughs> and I'm like, they're and they're rehearsing, they're practicing. And I said, there's an air show this weekend. Like, like, yeah. And, and this was how I got her back. She said, haven't you heard it on the radio? And I said, radio, what's that? So we had fun anyway. <laughs> so. I didn't. I had no idea there was an air show that close to me, and it was going to be happening all weekend. I think this was on a Friday, so I had Saturday to get there, or, or it was happening on Saturday. I was there on the store on Saturday. I think I had Sunday was the last day, and I said, I've always wanted to shoot an air show. I even bought a lens to shoot an air show that I'd never used to shoot an air show. And I'm scared because I've never shot an air show. And the only thing to be scared of is that you won't get a shot. Like you won't get anything good. Like literally, that's the only thing that can go wrong. And I said, that's it. I'm doing it. Uh, I'm going. So that night, that day, I came home. I bought my ticket online and I geared up. I went and looked at some, some like things, best practices and things to do. And I like, you know, made sure I had all the right stuff for my camera and right, made sure I had all the right settings ready to go. And I went to the air show. So let me show you. Um, and I'm in a collection right now in Lightroom Classic. That's my, like some of my favorite shots. And so let me um, just quickly go through those and then we'll get into the particulars of the behind the scenes and the particulars of the shots. So this is the air show. I'm lining up and notice it says Flight Line, uh, Flight Line Club VIP. So what I learned from years and years of going to events 
concerts, shows, anything where something's per performing in front of you, if you don't get good seats, you're not going to necessarily get good shots. If you get good seats, you got a better chance of getting good shots. So I bought the, the top VIP ticket so that I could get closer access. I need all the help I can get being my first air show. So being closer will help. That's what that's the way I figured it. So um, for the VIP, and it's just, you just pay more. So you get this tent, they have food, so forth and so on before everything starts. And if you look past the people in the tent, you see the Blue Angels jets literally right there. You can almost reach out and touch them. They're that close. So there's no closer way to get to, to be up close to the planes than to pay for better seating to be up close to the planes. So that was the show. This was back in November 5th through 6th. So I guess I was there on the 6th, the last day. And that's me. And that's me with the camera and the lens. And I, and I didn't have my new camera yet. It didn't exist. I have a Z8 now. And so this is my Z62. So Nikon Z62 with a Tamron uh, 150 to 600 millimeter lens, all the way fully extended, of course, just to show it off. Uh, that lens, the reason I got it, knowing that one day I might shoot an air show is because, or I wanted to shoot an air show, and, and if I have the lens, that'll kind of force me to go do it because I paid for the lens. Uh, that lens, the, the, the beauty of it is that it's, it's relatively low cost. You think a big lens like that is going to be several thousand dollars. And usually if you buy them from the company, the manufacturer like Canon, Nikon, whatever, they will be several thousand dollars. But this lens, I believe, is going for right around 900 these days. I just sold it and I got a lot less than that for it. But anyway, um, I think when I bought it, it might have been 11, 1200, and now you could probably get it for a thousand or less. And you can definitely get it used for a thousand or less because I just sold one. All right. Um, so 150 millimeter to 600 millimeter, I got the distance. I got what I need to be able to take the shots. All right. So the show starts off with you know this uh, this paratrooper coming in, um, flag and parachuting in. And I, I'm like, oh, oh click, click, click. I, I, I don't know what I'm doing yet, so I'm just, I'm just shooting. Then when the show starts, and I'm, I'm not like showing you every single shot. I'm just kind of showing you some of my favorites that I picked. They usually start with the prop planes before they start with the um, jets. So the prop planes are usually come out first. They do their shows. They do all the smoke. They do their low flying, all that. That usually happens first. And then you start to see the Jets and the Blue Angels and the Warthogs and all the other planes that they have. Uh, so this gave me some time to warm up because what I was really there for were the Jets. I'm going to talk about the shots and what it takes to get some of these settings and all. But uh, this gave me some time to practice. So <clears throat> you, <clears throat> you basically leave the tent, walk up to the fence and just start shooting. And you're there with 100 other people doing the exact same thing. Um, now <clears throat> I will tell you, remember when I said, well, what could go wrong? Well, the, the biggest disappointment that you can have coming from a show like this is you, you took hundreds or thousands, usually thousands of frames and they're all out of focus or they're not sharp or they're not this or they're not. In other words, they can't be salvaged. In other words, they're just, they're so bad that no amount of post-processing is going to make them good. So, um, you're, you're waiting with bated breath as you get, when you get to your computer to start going through them and really zooming in and looking at them big, big to make sure that they are in fact in focus. <clears throat> because that is the biggest thing that can go wrong is that they're just blurry, they're, they're just, you know, you're not gonna use them in that case. So I, I lucked up, <laughs> I did get some shots and the ones on the ground are a lot easier, they're not moving uh, or not moving fast. Those are a lot easier to get in focus. And uh, the ones in the air, they're flying low in front of you. Usually they're flying a little slower sometimes. So those are a lot easier to get in focus as well. And so um, I, I got some shots. I got some that actually made it into my portfolio and all. Um, these were the Blue Angels parked literally right in front of me. So I didn't even, I, I could have shot this with anything. I could have shot it with my phone. It was that close. And um <clears throat> One of the things I learned, remember I said I researched some of the best practices? 
is that when you're when you're photo and I'll talk about all the modes and all that in a minute. When you're photographing a prop plane, what you want to do is you want to have that propeller have some blur. Because if you shoot it with a shutter speed that's too fast, it'll freeze it. And it'll just look like the prop is just like the plane is just floating there in midair and that's not spinning. Just because you have such a fast shutter speed, you froze it and it's not spinning, so it doesn't look more it doesn't look as realistic. So shooting jets is one setting, shooting prop planes or propeller planes is another setting because you always want that blur of the propeller. But that's even trickier because you want the blur of the propeller, you don't want the blur of the plane. So just, you have to, you know, do that. <laughs> so I love some of these behind the scenes shots, you know, the pilots uh, or the planes, the cockpits, all of that. Um, and this is them, like they do a whole performance getting in. So I, I got some of that too. And, and, and uh, I could probably read his name if I zoom in. Because again, having access. Uh, so this, this is coming up to one of my favorite shots where they always have, uh, and I, I forget the official title of the person helping them out and getting them ready. But if you're a Navy person or a flight person, you'll know the title of that guy on the wing. Uh, but anyway, this is just, this is just a random shot, and it's my favorite. It's one of my favorites on the ground because it was just that moment of we're a team. Like this is this is this is something you would see on a poster. Like we're just fist bumping. This is the shot that really, like, oh my god, I can't believe I got that. Like I and I, you know, I shot it like I don't know how many frames to get it, but I was like, da -da 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 -da. yeah, really fast just to make sure I got it. And again, that just happened in front of me. I didn't know that was going to happen. So you got to always be prepared. And that's another thing with an air show, I will say. You're not pausing. Like you are always on. And what I mean by that, unless you've seen the show before, unless you know what's going to happen, you don't know what's going to happen. So they're making announcements. They're saying, oh, you know, so-and-so is about to fly over or so-and-so is coming in or they're going to do this maneuver or whatever. But unless you've seen it before, you don't know exactly where in the sky it's going to take place. You have an idea, you're aiming in that direction, but you don't know where. So you have to always be prepared. So again, just this was an example of had I not been shooting the whole time or, and ready to get a shot, I'd have missed this because I didn't know what was going to happen and it was completely unexpected. All right, so um, then, you know, you'll get a lot of them taxiing. And, of course, now I'm getting to the jet shots. And these are some of my favorites because this is kind of what I went there to shoot. And um, it, this is also one of my favorites. We'll get into the behind the scenes of this one as well. And just like I, I was having a ball. So um, when I got home, I was happy. Now, I took probably... I don't know, 3,000 frames that day, like 3,000 images came into Lightroom Classic when I got home. And a thousand of them immediately got deleted. Like just, I went through, you know, went through each one and like I was, oh, that's out of focus, delete. Oh, that's, you know, that one's whatever, delete. Oh, I missed the, the angle I wanted, delete. Like the, there were just a thousand that were immediately going in the trash. Because you got to make sure that even though you shot 3,000 frames, if you're not going to ever use it because something's wrong with it, there's no reason to hang on to that data. There's no reason to hang on to that file. And I don't mean that, oh, it could be fixed if I use the right software or use the right technique. I mean, these are shots that they're just never going to be right. So just get rid of those right off the bat because what that will leave you with is the ones you really like, the ones that are usable, the ones that are good. All right, so that's the end of the favorites. And I still have uh, 2,100 shots uh, in the main folder. So we're going to get into some of those and, and, again, get into some of the behind the scenes and, and how to fix. So let, let's go over a couple settings first since this is a photography show. Uh, let's go into what it takes to shoot the propeller planes versus the jets. And it's really two different settings. Now, first and foremost, I'm a studio shooter mostly. I shoot portraits in studio. And I shoot travel, like, you know, travel scenes, like nice, nice travel shots. 
So I'm used to working in one of two modes. I'm used to working in manual when I'm in the studio where I'm controlling the light, controlling everything, because I can, it's easy. And I'm used to work shooting an aperture priority when I'm walking and on the go. So let's think, think of the difference of you're stationary, you're controlling the subject, you're controlling the scene, you're setting everything, the, you, can, you can shoot it again if you don't get it right. I can shoot manual and keep making adjustments until I get it the way I want. Because nothing, I, I'm in complete control of the setup. I'm in complete control of the lighting. But when I'm walking around, like a photo walk or a travel scene, I may not have time to dial it in. I may only get one click. So I'm usually on aperture priority where I'm only shut setting the f-stop and the camera shut setting the shutter speed. That's what aperture priority does. So I'm usually between one of those two modes. When it comes to an air show, car show, not show, but um, racing, any horses, anything moving fast, anything moving, you're not going to be in either one of those. You're not going to, well, I take that back. You could be a manual if that's what the way, way you like to roll, but you're usually going to be a shutter priority. So aperture priority, manual, shutter priority. What's the difference? In aperture priority, you, you just set your f-stop and the camera will set the appropriate shutter speed based on the available light. In manual, you're setting both the shutter speed and the, and the uh, aperture or f-stop. So you're saying, oh, I want the shutter speed to be this fast or this slow. I want the, um, the f-stop to be this to keep the background in focus or out of focus. You're, set, you're doing all that yourself. Shutter priority, you're setting a shutter speed and the camera's picking the aperture. So it's the opposite of aperture priority. And the reason you're picking a shutter speed is because that's the most important thing. You're either freezing the action or you're letting a little bit of blur come in like on the props. So you're controlling that aspect and the camera controls the rest. Now, could you do it in manual? Yeah, absolutely. People do it, I'm sure, do it in manual every single day. But then you're asking for more work because unless you're really, really good at knowing what to dial in, you are setting yourself up for more work and possibly missed shots. So Nicholas asking a great question. What about ISO setting? Because if you're setting the shutter speed and it's going to adjust the aperture, depending on, you know, is it cloudy? Is it shady? Is it whatever? What's your ISO setting? Because normally in studio, I'd have it on 100. But when I'm walking around on aperture priority, I have it set to auto ISO because I don't know what's going to happen with the lighting depending on what I aim at and what I shoot. Same thing with the with the air show. I, sh I had it on auto ISO because, again, that was one less thing I wanted to have to worry about. Now, there will be people that will argue with me, argue with you on all of what I just said. <laughs> and it's okay. At the end of the day, if you're arguing, that means you have a better way for you to do it. Keep doing it your way for you. I'm talking about to the people that don't have a way yet and they want to know. So somebody's going to say, I shoot manual. I know what I'm doing. I, I know auto anything. I'm going to do it all. Great. Go do you. What I'm saying to people that may want, may hear that because that's old school thinking. I'm a professional. I should shoot manual. I should do it all myself. We spend thousands of dollars every year on camera gear. Every time a new body comes out, we want it or we get it, one of the two. And eventually you upgrade. And the reason you usually upgrade is because there was something in that newer camera that has something that your older camera didn't have, a better processor, better uh, sensor, better this, better, better autofocus, better this. And when you're saying, I'm just gonna shoot manual and turn all that off, then why are you buying a new camera? Because what you're saying is, I don't want the benefit of what my camera can do. I'm going to do it myself. <laughs> and that's fine if that's what you like. But I bought a camera, a newer camera, because it had newer features and newer technologies to help me get the shot. So if you feel that's not enough, you should do it all yourself. Do it all yourself. I'm going to let the camera do as much of the work and heavy lifting as I can. Because then I can concentrate on the other stuff, the creative stuff, the composition, the stuff that the camera doesn't do automatically. That makes sense? So, 
whichever one you are, you do that. Okay, so um, now that we got that speech out of the way, let's go into the settings here. And so if I look at this particular shot, uh, let me look at the settings. So the ISO was 100 for this. So again, it did the right thing because it was a nice, beautiful, bright day. And the shutter speed on this one is going to be 1 one twenty fifth of a second. And normally for the um, propeller planes, I target it normally. Um, and I was practicing on this, so I probably hadn't got to my main setting yet. Let me go to, um, or maybe I had, I don't know. Let's see which one's which. I'll show you one with my main setting. These are all like one one hundredth, one two hundredth, one two fiftieth. Um, and that's where I was kind of trying to stay. I'm just looking at these and see if I can find the one I'm looking for here. That's one one twenty fifth. Here we go. Yeah. Okay. So these are one two fiftieth. And with the ones that are one two fiftieth, you get that nice blur. And again, you have to worry that you may not get that in focus. So you may want to drop it down a little bit if that's a concern. But anyway, I never went over that. Like that was the that was the fastest I went with was one two fiftieth of a second. And again, at ISO 100 or auto ISO, if I thought that was going to be too dark. All right, so what did I do for the jets? Well, the jets are flying a lot faster and there's no propeller blur to worry about. And you definitely want to keep those in focus. So you want to freeze the action as best you can. Those are a big difference. Those were shot at one one thousandth of a second. So one one twenty fifth to two fiftieth for the props jumping all the way up to one thousandth of a second for the jets because I want to freeze them as best I can. Now you can go faster. I mean, you, can, you know, your camera can shoot as fast as you want. Um, but that was basically what, and that one ended up being one ISO 110. So auto kept, kept it down low and did it at 110. And that, that one, again, I can see that everything's kind of in focus. That one did the right thing because I had the shutter speed fast enough to um, to freeze the action as they fly by. And, and literally, by the way, this is how an air show works. You see the plane coming and you're just, and, and by the way, my, my Nikon Z6 II doesn't have any kind of automatic tracking for planes. Like it doesn't have that mode. Some newer cameras, like my new camera, has a mode for planes. So you just set it on that mode and it automatically locks onto the plane and keeps it in the focus the whole time. Great. I don't have to do that manually. I know if you're a manual person, you probably say, I don't use that. I just do it manually. Good for you. Anyway, so you're going to see the plane coming in and you're going to lock on, you're going to lock your continuous focus on, by the way, well, that's another setting. You're going to set it for continuous focus and you're going to press the shutter half down till it locks on. And then you're just going to keep, you're going to have it on, um, uh, whatever the shutter thing is called that keeps shooting, continuous shutter. Uh, you're gonna get, then just shoot it as it goes by, and you're gonna hope you got it. Because remember, I said the lens was 150 to 150 to uh 600. Well, you're also zooming because when it's far out, you're zooming in on it, and as it gets closer, it's closer, so you can't be zoomed in on it. So you're also adjusting your zoom while you're tracking it as it goes by and shooting and hope you get the shot. So those are the kinds of things that went into the settings. I did shoot in raw. Uh, the old adage of, you know, your camera's not fast enough to shoot in raw, so therefore you need to shoot in JPEG when it's something fast moving so you can get more frames as you're doing continuous shutter. A lot of that's gone away with, especially with the newer newer mirrorless cameras. They're fast enough now to shoot multiple frames really quickly in RAW. So um, that's one of those things that, you, you, again, I, I ask that question for people that shoot air shows all the time. Should I shoot in JPEG? They're like, no, we shoot in RAW. And because you're going to have more data to work with and more image, you know, best possible quality image from your shutter, or from, I'm sorry, from your camera sensor, to work with uh, when you're shooting raw. So no, no automatic processing with a JPEG. These are all raw shots, all shot, continuous, high speed, auto ISO, shutter priority, 
and that's what I got. All right, so now let's go in and let's talk about some of the what what went into the post process because you're seeing all of these are finished. So like you're seeing the finished shots. Now let's go look at some of the ones that before they looked like they look now. So I'm going to go into this one. I just have it selected. And then that way, when I go to the main folder where all the shots in, it will still be selected. All right, so there it is. And I'm going to go in and um, I'm going to make a virtual copy because I don't want to screw up my, my edit. So I'm going to make a virtual copy. And when I make a virtual copy in Lightroom Classic, it's going to make it exactly the way it was. But now I'm going to go into the develop and reset it. That's what I originally started with. So it was, I, I cropped to zoom in because to me it was just too far away. Now, that's not bad for a reset. That The only thing really that on that particular shot was the cropping that didn't look as good. Uh, but now, so here's what you want to do. If you're going to crop into a shot, and, and let me say this before we actually do the crop. I'm I'm one of the per people that says you know I don't need a million megapixels like I don't need mil I don't need a better camera just because it has more megapixels, except <laughs> there's one exception to that rule when you want to do this because if you're starting out with more megapixels like this is the this camera is a 24 megapixel camera my new one's 48 had I shot this with my newer camera my 48 megapixel camera. I'd have more more data when I crop it. The image would still be large. So normally I don't care for portraits. 24 megapixels is perfect for portraits. I don't need anything bigger than that. But if you're shooting something far away that you're going to crop into, then you want more megapixels if you got them. So that would be an advantage to a bigger, higher megapixel camera for shooting air shows for this reason. Okay, but the file is going to be bigger. And uh, depending on the camera, you may not get as many and, and like, you know, while you're holding the shutter down. So those are all considerations. All right. So I went into the crop tool. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Back up, back up, back up, back up. Let's get out of the. Oh, hang on. Undo, undo. Um, let's do what I normally do first. So I was, I was about to jump into the crop. So I didn't crop it yet. I went in and started making my adjustments. So I set the, I, I don't remember which profile I used. I probably used Vivid because um, it's not really a landscape. It's not definitely not a portrait and I kind of want it to be vivid. Well, so I, I might've shot vivid. I might've shot landscape depending on which, or I might've switched to landscape, whichever one that I wanted. Uh, I probably use landscape, but now that I'm looking at vivid, I kind of like vivid better. And vivid, all this, all this profile is doing, it's a raw profile. It's basically just setting the foundation for your image. So I did that. Then I always do the exact same thing. Next button I hit is auto. I um, auto, uh, auto tone. Now auto tone in this case, I don't like some of the settings. In most cases, I don't like some of the settings, but some I do like. So this way I only have to change the ones I don't like. It made it too dark. So I'm gonna go ahead and just reset the, um, the exposure back to what it was on. So I just reset the exposure with a double click back to zero. Everything else I'm okay with. So normally when it does auto tone and I'm doing people, it adjusts the vibrance and saturation. I usually reset those back to zero, but in this case, I don't care. It's a jet. It's, it can be more vibrant. It can be more saturated. Now I would get into the crop before I do any more detail work because I, I, I want to be able to see it on the actual plane. So when you're going to use a crop tool, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I always make that mistake now because of the keyboard shortcuts different. When you're, um, so whenever you see me do that, I hit C for, and, and C in Lightroom Classic is compare. So it takes the two shots and compares them side by side. C in Lightroom Cloud is crop. So I'm so used to hitting C over there and C makes sense that I'm not used to hitting the letter R anymore for crop in Lightroom Classic. Anyway, back to our story. So uh, when you're cropping, you also want to keep composition into your thought process. Now we have this nice jet stream coming out of the back of it. I don't want to lose any of that. So I'm not going to crop this way because I like that. I like that jet. I like the cloud or that, that smoke. I like the cloud as well. So I'm going to come in from the other direction. The other thing you don't want to do in, a, in an action shot like this is you don't want to come in too close because you want to leave enough room for the thing you're, you're cropping 
to it's moving this or it's moving this way. I wanted to have enough space or sky to move to continue to fly. So I would never crop that tight on something that's moving that way. So just a, a composition thing. So let's uh, undo that. So what I would do, and by the way, um, you can still decide whether or not you want to lock the aspect ratio or you want to set it to a specific aspect ratio. So I'm, I didn't, I didn't I didn't print any of these. If I were going to print it, I might go ahead and switch to an eight by 10 or, or, you know, a standard aspect ratio for printing. That way I don't have to worry about it when I print it and, and I'm just cropping off extra sky anyway. It doesn't really matter. So I might go ahead and constrain it to that four by five, eight by 10. Now, of course that constrained it on the sides. I'm still going to move it over so I don't lose any of that jet stream. And then I'm going to go ahead and go up this way. And that's about all I'm going to do. Like, so I'm basically putting it in a better position in the sky, closer to us so we can see it. Then I hit the letter R to get out of crop. Now, almost, I can't think of a situation when I wouldn't do this. I want this image to be as sharp as possible. So you start in camera, make it as in focus as possible, but then there haven't, I haven't met a shot yet that couldn't stand to be sharpened in post as well. So, you know, people all say, well, how do your, how'd you get your images so sharp? And the answer is I sharpen them. So that's always the case. Now, uh, Lightroom sharpen is good. Texture is great. Clarity is good too. But I'll be honest. If I want it to be as sharp as possible, I use a third-party plugin. Yep, I said it. I use Topaz AI Sharpen because it just does a better sharpening job than the built-in sharpening. There's nothing wrong with the built-in sharpening. It's like you're starting with good, pretty good, but you want better. So that's Topaz. So there's no, I can, I can definitely use the sharpening here and get the results I want or get res, good results, I should say. But if I want to take it to the next level, go check out Topaz, uh, the company. They make um, all kinds of AI sharpening and photo tools and so forth and so on. So I think they make a new one now, AI Photo, that comprises all the sharpening and other features that they had separate plugins for. But AI Sharpen um, is what I would take this over to if I really want it to be sharp as possible. We're gonna stick in Lightroom for now. And uh, let's let's see what we can do here. So I zoomed into it. And again, it's it's definitely in focus. It looks pretty sharp as is. And if I go down to the detail, um, there's some sharpening that automatically gets applied to your raw file. So it's already set to 40. That's the default that you get just by opening the raw file. You don't have to do anything else. Lightroom's automatically going to say you lost some sharpening from the camera to Lightroom. We're going to put it back by changing, by changing the sharpen automatically to 40. All right. Um, if you want to go higher, I normally wouldn't do this on people but I could definitely do it on objects like a plane. Now, if I take it too far, and this is what this is, I will tell you one of the main things you need to worry about and be concerned about when you're making any adjustments to an object like this is if you overdo it, there will be a halo around the object. You'll see like a white line around the object or whatever color. You can start to see a little bit of it here, but that's not, I'm zoomed in. So that's not something you would ever notice zoomed out zoomed out is fine but when you start to see that halo you know you've gone too far so if i take the sharpening all the way over well first of all that's <laughs> i don't necessarily get a halo but i'm destroying the sky so what might i do instead let's undo it let's go back out let's go into um masking and oh, there's already, is there a mask already there? There's a mask already there. So I would, uh, I thought I reset it. I thought I reset it. Maybe it didn't get rid of the mask, but let, let's go ahead and delete it anyway. I'm going to delete this and let's go ahead. And now we're in masking. We're going to say select subject. So now that will create a mask automatically. I'm just going to rename it plain so we know what, what it is. All right. So now we got a mask for the plane. Now, if I do that, extreme sharpening it's not going to touch the sky i'm just working on the plane the sky is fine the way it is all right so now if i were to go ahead and zoom in 
and I were to go ahead and um, go to sharpen. See, if I drag it all the way over, nothing happens to the sky. Don't drag it all the way over because you are destroying other pixels. Like the U.S. is starting to go now. And versus if I go the other way, you can start to see it affecting the U.S. So just a little bit of sharpening, a little bit more than you, you had before. So I took it to like 20. That's probably still too much. But just now it's only happening to the plane. What you might also do is in, in lieu of so much sharpening, maybe pull the sharpening back a little bit more because texture is way more forgiving. So if I bump up the texture, again, that's low texture, that's higher texture, you have more room to play with texture and clarity than you do sharpening because sharpening is going to get bad pretty quickly if you go too far. Texture and clarity have a little bit more room to play. What's the difference between texture and clarity? I get that question all the time. So texture is literally just the texture. Like it's not gonna affect anything else. It's gonna make the texture sharper or less sharp. Clarity is texture plus shadows and highlights. So for example, if I reset texture back to zero and I now just do clarity, look at the plane get darker or lighter. So it's not just affecting the texture, it's also affecting the shadows and highlights. So if you don't want that, because sometimes it looks good, in this case it doesn't. If you don't want that, stick to texture. If you say, oh, I want that too, then just use clarity because it's gonna do both. Uh, all right, so I'm just gonna bump, the, um, bump up the texture a little bit more. All right, now if I zoom back out, I might also be able to do some more things since I got the plane mass by itself. I might be able to go a little bit lighter on the plane. Look at that. We can bring out way more detail just by bumping up the exposure just on the plane. Not The sky looks fine. The sky is perfect the way it is. Mother Nature did a great job that day. I don't need to touch the sky. I just want to touch the plane, make sure the plane looks good. All right. Um, so I just, again, that's just going from that to that. Just bringing it out a little bit more. And if we zoom in, I'll just grab our zoom tool. Look at that. And again, before and after. So don't be afraid to go in and do things to your jet, like just to make it even better than it was out of the camera. All right. And that's pretty much it for that shot. Like I, I can't think of anything else I would do. So basically all we did was crop. We masked it. We sharpened it. You know, texture or clarity, uh, or texture, clarity, or sharpen, or both, uh, sharpen and texture. And then we just bump up the exposure a little bit. Now, again, I could go in and say, uh, well, let me see what I would get if I increase the saturation a little bit more. And yeah, this is not making a big enough difference for me to worry about. That's about it. So that's that shot. That's what I would do. So this is your before. Look at that. Nothing wrong with it before. But for every shot that comes out of your camera, it could be better. And that's for all the people that say, I did it technically correct. I shot it on the right settings. I did it manually. I did it blah, 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 blah. I guarantee you, every shot you've taken that you did all the right things in the camera could look better. I guarantee it. There's no shot in the camera that ever comes out that couldn't be improved. All right, so that's it. That's the out of the camera, technically correct. Everything's in focus, the right, you know, with the crop, the right composition. That's just juicing it, just making it look a little bit better. All right, next up. Uh, let's go ahead and take a look at, so I'm going to go ahead and filter these because, oh, I didn't even, I don't think I even did anything with any of these. Let's see. Yeah, see, those might be, they're okay. They're a little noisy. So I see this noise in the shot. And if I look at my ISO, it's only ISO 250. So why is there, you know, just, it's just the noise. So what I might do on this particular shot is I might go into develop. And now that we have that wonderful denoise feature, I might run that and see what that does. Yeah. So just denoising that. Now, again, I may not use this shot because it's not as sharp as it could be. Maybe I can make that change. But just denoising it, and maybe I don't need to denoise it as much. So that's no denoise. So I would bump up the, always move the slider to no more than you need. In other words, don't take it over to 100 just because you can. 
because then you're making other things less sharp that could could have been sharper had you not taken it over that far. So I'm just basically starting at the beginning where it is noisy and moving my denoise slider until I don't see the noise anymore. And then I can stop. I don't need to go any further then because that was the whole point of coming in here was getting rid of the visible noise. Then once I click enhance, that will make a, over in the upper left corner, you can see it processing, that will make a brand new um, raw file, brand new DNG. Yes, AI denoise for the win. And we'll just let that cook a few more seconds. Looks like it's about to finish. Oh, it's probably writing the file and if these files are on my NAS. It's going to take a little bit longer. All right. But then what I would do, I'll just let you know up front and it just finished. Um, it's almost finished. There we go. Just finished. And let's see what it looks like. Uh, yeah, here's the enhanced one, the noise reduction. So here's the original. And again, it looks fine, zoomed out. That's the original and that's the denoise version. So big visible difference in the sky. Now that I got my great denoise version, I'm gonna zoom back out, go into the develop module, and same thing. I'm gonna mask it, see if it masks the, the planes. Select subject. And it got the jet stream too, but that's okay. And now I can go in and I can do those same things we talked about. Or I could paint out the jet stream if I don't want. So here's the other thing. If the AI-based select subject doesn't get the subject the way you want it, doesn't mean you can't fix it. It can mean you can't change it. So let's say I just want the planes. I don't want the jet stream behind it. I don't want the smoke. All right, you don't want that smoke. Anyway, let's go in and let's subtract. And we're just going to say subtract with a brush. Because then I can brush out and say, hey, don't select the smoke. Just select the planes. I'm make my brush smaller and get closer to the plane. There we go, something like that. You don't have to live with Oh, it didn't really select it the way I want it to. Oh, well, there's nothing I can do about it. There is something you can do about it. Add or subtract to the areas that you want. And I can go, I'd zoom in and get in between the wings and get in between the plane and make sure I got all the sky deselected. But anyway, enough of that. Let's go back to the plane. And now let's zoom in. See, that's what I mean. So I have to brush in between here to make sure I got that all out. But we're going to go ahead and say that, hey, we want to adjust our, and it stays red until you make your first adjustment. So this, the what you're seeing is the mask. And that's good because it shows me if I got the mask right before I started trying to adjust. So now I can go ahead and I could bump up the texture of this. So that's low texture. That's higher texture. That looks a lot better. And I would probably go in and Nope, no exposure, no exposure, exposure's fine. The bad things were starting to happen when I went to exposure. And maybe the shadows, yeah, okay. Bump up the shadows a little bit, a hair. Bring down the highlights a little bit and increase that contrast a little bit. And then also um, I bumped the texture. Let's see if sharpening, that's too much. Pull it back and sharpen it. All right. Now, uh, we still did not. Still not, didn't make any of our normal adjustments. We didn't go into basic. We didn't choose. Oh, we did. This, uh, this photo had already been adjusted. Sorry about that. Yeah. So that's why it looks so much better than the other one. Anyway, and, and so if that's the shot you want it, you're good. But, you know, I probably want less sky. So we're going to go ahead and use our, uh, not R, or not C, R. And we're going to go ahead then and do the same thing just because I don't care. It might as well be an aspect ratio that's good for print. Um, I'm going to go ahead and pull that in just a bit and maybe right about there. Just give them enough room to fly and then move that over to right about there from a composition standpoint. And that's my new shot. So yeah, before, let's see how much duller it looks. So here, let me zoom in. Before, kind of dull, kind of washed out. After, just a little bit sharper. So, and again, that you know, had I had a better shot, I'd have better results. So this one it was as good as it was going to get. All right, so next, let's go ahead and, um, what was I about to do? I was going to come in here and I was going to filter on. 
Uh, I did my picks. That's good enough. All right, so here's another one. This is one of the ones I wanted to show you. That's the after. That's the before. <laughs> so you're saying, oh, my God. It's, it's, it's a silhouette almost. So, again, I shot raw. I know the data's there. I know I can get the right shot out of this shot. As long as I got it in focus, as long as I got the stuff right in the camera, the rest is easier to fix. So, again, I, you know, if I'd have sat there playing with settings, I wouldn't have the shot. So, this was shooting the same settings, get the shot, then come back to post and, and finish it. Not fix it, finish it. So, let's go to develop. And... Um, uh, same thing, we're going to switch over to probably Vivid, and we're going to switch to Auto. Already looking better. And we're going to, um, now, uh, just try to decide what I want to do next. I want to go in next and do a mask. And we're going to go ahead and select the subject again. That should be the planes, yep. And then we're going to invert that mask. So basically we have the planes, I want everything but the planes. So I'm just going to come over and hit Invert Mask 1. And then we're going to call this mask sky. All right, so now we've got the sky selected. Now we can make the sky better because that's really what was wrong. So, um, for example, I might go into the temperature and make the sky bluer. Ooh, look at that. Now, again, I would have to unmask the, the, the smoke if you don't want the smoke. Oh, I have to mask the smoke. I basically take the smoke out of the sky selection. <laughs> And that way the smoke wouldn't be turning blue as well. But I don't, I don't mind the blue smoke. That's not bothering me. Uh, but if, you, if it did bother you, if you want the gray smoke, then just go out and paint the smoke out of the shot. And you might have to zoom in to do that just right. There we go. And of course, uh, I haven't met a sky yet that couldn't use uh, a little dehaze. So just look at that. Look at how much better we can make that sky. And again, I can see where I, it didn't select it right here. There's a piece missing, so I need to add that into the mask. And uh, so now I may not even need the temperature to be as much. Let's do that. So, okay, so go back to that mask. And we're going to add to it. And we're going to add with a brush. And we're going to just go ahead and see if I just paint that in. Then I'm telling it that that part of the sky is also part of this. And I think this might need it too. And this definitely needs it up here. So basically just fixing the parts that I want. Now, like I said before, if you wanted to um, subtract, you can go to that mask and you hit subtract and also use a brush. And if you don't want the smoke, again, you'd have to, it's really tricky. You'd have to zoom in and do it or, or, or undo. I haven't tried this yet. Let's try it. Subtract using the object selection tool because the object selection tool works, um, works either with a brush or with a rectangular selection. So if I just brush this, let's see if it's smart enough to figure out that I don't want the smoke. If it does this, this is worth its weight in gold right here. Let's see, undo or let go. Nah, it still got, still got, it doesn't smart enough. It's not smart enough to know the difference between smoke and clouds because they look the same. All right, so AI, I will forgive you for that one. But you'd have to go in and basically just make sure you got, um, you'd have to paint really, you have to zoom it up and use a really small brush and paint each part of the smoke if you didn't want that smoke uh, to be the blue or get the same effects. All right, so the sky is looking a lot better. Now we're not done yet. Let's go ahead and uh, hit our mask one more time and let's go ahead and create a new mask. This time we're going to select subject again. Now we have the planes and we can go ahead and name that one planes. And now that we have the planes, we can go ahead and make sure that we uh, do the things we want to do on the planes. So I want the planes a little bit more. Ex uh, no, 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 not the exposure. Maybe just the shadows. There we go. Shadows, not the rest of the exposure. And definitely, we can use um, we can use a couple things here. We can use that. Uh, <laughs> there we go. Texture. And we can use a little, maybe even a little dehaze, even though that should only be doing it on the planes. Oh, you know why? Because I'm down below in that. Never mind. That was me. That was my my bad. I was down in the global area. Undo. I should be here. 
there we go. So, in case you run into that mistake, I was looking for, for uh, dehaze and I scrolled down too far. This is the adjustments for the whole image. These are the adjustments for the mask. I want the adjustments for the mask. So, texture. So I would need to go back down and make sure I turn off the texture um, for the whole image because I don't want it for the whole image. I just want it for the mask. All right. Uh, dun, 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 dun. We did the shadows. Maybe bump the contrast a little bit more. I still think it could be a little brighter. All right, let's bump the whole exposure just a little bit and more like that. Okay, great. So before, after. With just a few adjustments, again, from our finished photo. Now, if we really want to see uh, the before and after, let's get out. And this is even better than the first one I edited. Let's make another, um, another virtual copy. And let's reset that one. Reset. Or no, that one is the reset. I'm sorry. No, that's the reset. Okay. That's the, out of the camera. That's with a few adjustments. So that's how I got the shot. <laughs> like literally, that's how I got it. Made sure I started with a great image and then finish it. So this is the one you would see on a poster. This is the one you see on a brochure. Not the one you got technically correct out of the camera. Because you want it to look like this. All right. And again, adjust to your taste. If it's too much, too little, make it more, make it less. Do your thing. All right, we got a few minutes left um, in today's session. Hopefully, you're getting something out of this. Uh, probably don't have time to run through a full explanation of another one. But let's just go through another one and kind of see the before. Um, yeah, that these, these were tricky. So here, let me virtual copy it. And let's hit that reset on the virtual copy and see what that one looked like originally. All right, so that was the original. It's just too dark. Uh, so here's the one I edited. Here's the original. And so uh, same kind of stuff. Um, Vivid, Auto Tone. Auto Tone just really did a bit better job. I could still go in and bump up the shadows a little bit more. Kind of bring out, look at that detail because you shot raw. And uh, we can add a little bit more contrast to it and go from there. So, uh, what was I on? 10 with the hands, Scott social. Great. I'm just looking at the comments, make sure I didn't miss anything. How about the color range after you mask uh, out the plane? Sure, you could use the color range on that as well. Just another way to do it. Great. Tiny amount of stuff. Cool. I love to see your pictures printed on panorama paper. Me too. Um, all right. Good. So if there is, uh, if there put now's your chance to put stuff in the comments for what you want to see on the next episode of the photography morning show, we could always do a live shoot. I could bring in a guest. We could do things that are more photography centric because the masterclass is always going to stay, you know, this stuff is always going to be dedicated to the Lightroom Photoshop stuff in the world. And notice on, on almost, I would say on the vast majority of these, I did not need to go to Photoshop because there was nothing that needed to be removed or added or done to the shot um, that I would normally do those kinds of things in Photoshop. So in other words, for 95% of all my edits from this, this air show, they were all done in Lightroom I didn't, or Lightroom Classic. I didn't need to do anything else. All right, uh, let me know in the comments what you want next time and we'll try and fit that in. Uh, I'm glad you had a lot of fun, Tim Dalton, watching this. And uh, glad Gary loves the format. And you're welcome. Uh, stay tuned. I think you're going to see another show here on Behance in the next five minutes. Um, I'm just trying to think for the next 30 seconds. Is there anything I need to say? No, that's it. All right. Cheers, everyone. Thanks for watching. We'll catch you on the next one. I'll put you back in the lobby. And feel free to follow me. There's a there's a thing right there. Oh, it went away. It's gone. Feel free to follow me. I'm Terry Lee White at 99% of the places on, on the internet. Bye, everybody.